I just wanted to welcome everybody to this session. Uh, we are um, talking about winter gardening tasks today. Um, the workshop today, um, for those of you who have um, not been to one of these before, is um, part of a collaboration in lockdown workshop, gardening workshops under lockdown between Plant uh, in Tayport, which is us, um, Nine Wells Community Garden, Strathkinners Community Garden, and Yellow Wellies Gardening. And we've been running them for several months now um, with uh, quite a lot of success and interest. Um, the workshop itself is fund, our delivery of it is funded by a Climate Challenge Fund, um, um, which is a Scottish government money um, to fund grassroots action um, on climate change. And uh, if you've not heard about PLANT before, um, PLANT stands for People Learning About Plants, uh, About Nature in Tayport. And uh, we run local community garden as well as um, lots of other um, uh, little projects associated with it. And we're part of the Tayport Community Trust. My name is Kashka and I'm sort of a technical uh, support for this uh, workshop. I am a um, digital uh, storytelling uh, coordinator and carbon conversation coordinator for PLANT. And Ali Butler is our volunteer um, coordinator. She's going to help with Q&A. Ali, would you like to unmute yourself and say hello? Hello. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hear yeah. from her more uh, um, later. Yeah. But the main star <laughs> attraction of today is, of course, Peter Christopher, who is our community gardener with his assistant, Kirsten, who's going to be uh, shooting the, um, the footage today. And we're in a Tayport Community Garden today, which is quite exciting, but wet. So I'm just going to hand over to Peter to tell us all about winter gardening. Over to Peter. Hi there, and welcome from Kirsty and I in a rather soggy Sunday afternoon uh, to talk about what you can do or what we've been doing and continue to do over the winter. It's quite funny because lots of people will say, oh, there's not much gardening to be done in the winter. On the contrary, we hope this webinar will show you just exactly how many things you can be getting on with. There's a lot to get on with. Quite a lot of it's outdoors, so I'm going to have to rattle through quite a bit when we're outside. But in the meantime, I'll just tell you what we've been doing after we've cleared the summer crops. Christy, can I just, um, you've got fingers in the camera, sorry. I can't get, I can't get, um, I, all I can see is you. This is my problem. I can't get Peter on, the, on my screen. I can see Peter, I don't. I, all I can see is you. <laughs> But you can't see what your film is. I can't get that. <clears throat> oh, see, to go big. Can she, can she make out that one? Is it the plus sign? No. You on mute, Kashka? I can't see what's on your screen, um, guys. Normally, it means that you probably clicked on, on my picture to make me main head on your display usually if you slide slide right or left um it allows you to choose the view and on the ipad Well, I'll do, I can do it, but I can't see what I'm filming. That's well, the only can, problem. All I can see is Casper. But you have the little picture here. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, back to the veg. After we've cleared the beds from the summer crops, we're doing a winter catch crops. So this is, uh, no, then, was it greyhound lettuce, uh, cabbage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've also got some leaves, got groundkeeping potato just here. And over here on the other side, there's mizuna and cauliflowers. What's mizuna, Peter? Mizuna is a green leaf that you can cut and come again, just as a salad. Thank you. And spring onions, uh, spinach and other, other greens. Now, 
we also use the polytunnel for ripening up our pumpkins to try and get this nice and hard so they'll keep longer through the winter. We've also got some tax turbans here, which is quite decorative. Managed to save these from being turned into lanterns at Halloween. Much better eaten than thrown away. So moving down the bed, as we clear the beds and digging them over, we're also adding some of our wonderful homemade compost. And you can see how it's uh, broken down nicely and it's got lots of brandling worms in it. So we'll fork this in. That would be another crop, which I'll show you in a minute. Fork it down. Jobs you can do indoors when it's horrible like this. If you've collected any wildflower seeds like we have, this is a good time of year that you can process them and then store them in the uh, little bags and here's some that uh, we made using a bit of what would you call it paper. <laughs> it's paper yes uh, also a good time to go through your seeds find out what's out of date and what also you need to reorder for next spring other more onerous tasks are to collect all your labels that you've used and give them a good cleaning down. And we do this by using a piece of sandpaper on this mounted block, which is very handy. You can get all your pots and trays washed and sterilized, ready for next uh, season. You can also get some propagation done at this time of year. We have been growing runner beans in pots. So we'll have these just ticking over winter and get them planted out early spring or late winter. Same with this winter hardy pea. This one's called Meteor. This, by the way, is called Sutton, the broad bean. You can also use a variety called Aqua Dolce. Yeah, get your sweet peas started off nice and early as well. And if you fancy doing some propagation, you can certainly get on with that during the winter by doing what's called root cuttings. And plants that you can do from root cuttings are the sea holly, Lindium, elephant's ears, Virginia, and Japanese anemone. Although once you've got that, you're not getting rid of it. So onwards, we've got uh, cuttings that we struck in the late summer for next year's tender perennials. So here's a, a group of salvias. So we just took them over. Wonderful root ball there. So tease them apart and pot them up. You can also keep a succession of young seedlings going of lettuce. To fill it. This could be grown on your windowsill and just cut and come again for small salads. Other jobs to do indoors is um, save the best of your uh, summer bedding plants like these geraniums and get them potted up and keep them overwintered in a frost free light place. This is something that's a bit of fun really. We started this off in, when was it Kirsty? September? Yep. And these are new potatoes for Christmas time which are doing nicely. In fact some of them are beginning to go over so they'll definitely be ready for Christmas. Other tasks, ripen up their onions if you've got any left and make sure that they're good and ripe before you put them into storage. And for ornamental plants, you can lift your dahlia tubers, dry them off and then just store them in a mouse-free, frost-free place. You don't need to put them in soil until, oh, at least late March, April, and then you can start bringing them back into growth. It's worthwhile saving your um, gladioli as well and any other tender bulbs that you have. Just saves you a bit of money next sun, spring when you're planting out. And we're very lucky that we've been managing to uh, keep some of our plants going in the propagator. Also trying to ripen up the last of the tomatoes using a ripe banana 
as it gives off ethylene, which is a plant hormone. Now, I'm going to take over whilst Kirsty puts an umbrella on her head so that we can do a quick bit of filming outdoors. Uh, this month's must have fashion accessory. Right, the uh, garden cleanup continues. We've been emptying all these buckets we've been using to growing potatoes and courgettes and pumpkins in what would otherwise be a dead space. There's lots and lots of leaves to collect in your gardens at this time of year. And this is a very simple four post chicken wire and we put the leaves on as we gather them. And then you can cover it in the spring and then about a year later, you'll have wonderful friable leaf mold to use on your shrubs and borders. Over to the compost corner, very quickly. This is all the material from the garden during the summer. So we've got ornamental plants, we've got the courgettes that have finished, we've got the sweet corn stems. Um, these will all go through the shredder. So it's handy having a big pile like this so you can put them through the shredder all in a one -er. And if you've got lots of like-minded gardener friends, it's worthwhile getting this together so you can hire a machine, get it all done, and it splits the cost. Once you've got your shreddings all done, if you know any good, any um, people who've got horses, people who tend to have horses collect the dung off straight off the fields. And we're very lucky and we've donated this to bag up. So we'll mix the two. And once we've emptied out the, uh, this year's compost and spread it on the beds, then we'll be able to turn this one from the summer, mix through some of the new material, but go to our previous webinars about compost making. Right, over to the, no, it's actually managed to, it's not too bad now. Here's Bella's winter's bench. Mm. Herbaceous material, like this scabious, that can get cut right back to the ground. Things like the irises, it's sometimes worthwhile just taking the worst of the tops of the leaves off to stop rock from the wind damaging them. Now we have tender fruits such as the apricots, fig, and it's worthwhile keeping an eye on the weather because if we manage to get a really cold spell, a beast from the east, it's well worth wrapping these up in an old blanket. They don't need any light at this time of year, but that would afford them some protection from the worst of the cold. Right, scooting on. This is a lot of our uh, brassicas. The sprouts are just crying out for Christmas, uh, unlike the turkeys. And what we've done is taken off the fleece material, which we'd covered them in the summer to keep the pigeons and butterflies off but we've removed it and replaced it with a net. Now the net, if it does snow, the snow should go through it. It shouldn't actually fall too heavily on it, whereas the fleece might collapse under the weight. And every so often we just go through the brassica section and take off some of the dead lower leaves and uh, take them away so it doesn't have any build up of any diseases. Another outdoor task at this time of year, which is a Excellent thing to be getting on with. And that's planting out your garlic. You buy them as bulbs like this, split them up into individual cloves, and plant them just, you can plant them straight out into a nice row. And these have only been in for a couple of weeks and already they're raring to go. And these will be harvested in June, late June. Now this is a bed that's been cleared. We've still got the last of our wallflower to lift and put them into pots, containers and what have you. And then we will spread the compost on these bits of bed like this. Another thing you can do rather than covering them with compost is to maybe put cardboard down or newspaper and the wet will keep it down, hopefully, if it's windy. 
and it will just stop the rain, the winter rains, from leaching out a lot of the material. Cracking on to other winter vegetables. Now, this is a nice crop of celeriac that we have here. And we've got some really giant parsnips here. And leeks and sweet over there. The thing that I'd advise you to do if you've got a nice crop of these, these is um, at the first sign of any really bad cold weather, if you can get a hold of a bale of straw and just tuck the straw like they do in the fields with carrots so that they're easily harvested and don't get frozen into the ground. Bashing on to green manure. This is a section that we saw that we left. To show you the comparison of sowing a gra um, this is grazing rye and not having it. So it's too late, unfortunately, to grow any green manure, but that's one for the future. You can see the difference. So this will all lock up the nutrients and then it can get dung in in late winter. We've got more over here. Now this is a mustard. And the thing about this was it was growing so successfully that it was wanting to flower. Which is not a bad thing in itself, it's just that we don't want energy going in to try and make seeds. So we've cut it back, the stuff that we've cut back will rot down into the soil and we'll get fresh growth again to dig in in late winter. Now then, another thing that we can get on with is constructing. A lot of that this year took to gardening for sometimes some people their very first time. And I was just speaking to one of our participants who's been making raised beds. Now this is to try and get over the, any pest problems. It's also good for our family beds and the grandchildren or whatever can take part. And so we're going to be constructing more beds in any area over here. But we have With the help of some fantastic volunteers, a new path which is leading up to our new beds, which are going to be on the inside of our poly crub. Now, a poly crub is like a polytunnel, but made of polycarbonate. And it is extra strong, keeps more heat in. And in fact, it was developed in the Northern Isles and lots of crofters in the West Coast use them as well, because they will not blow away in um, Atlantic gales, because polytunnels will just get ripped. So this is going to be great because it's going to be a space that will be for learning and also for shelter and working during the really inclement weather, like taking cuttings and what have you. Quickly moving on. Keeping our pumpkin patch covered. Again, try not to have the rains washing out any of the goodness that's left. But we'll top these up in the spring uh, for another crop next year. Now, this is a great time of year to start making willow tunnels. It's also a very good time of year to do hardwood cuttings. So, our volunteers have been weaving this in to try and thicken it up and they say it's a very relaxing thing to do, very meditative. So to do this, November is the best time of year, you literally take a piece of willow, cut it below what was a leaf node and above what was a leaf node, make a hole with a metal rod or something poke it up to about half its length and it will start sprouting. It's amazing. This was only done three years ago this month from bits this size. From the cutting back material, I'm going to hand over to Ari. So if we go back to the tunnel for the Q&A, she's going to talk about these. So Ari, over to you and we'll see you in half a minute. Hi 
I um I, hi hi sorry yeah. apologies I, I switched my video off while Peter was doing that thank you Peter for that yeah we're going to be doing a willow wreath workshop um it'll be online so it'll be a bit like this um but we'll provide materials in bags that people can collect up and you can actually make something da, 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 like this can you all see that this is just, I made this this morning, so it's a bit rough and ready. Um, but you can see how we've woven the willow round to make the frame and then just sort of tied in bits of foliage. So we'll do these, we'll provide kits for these, but we'll also do, we've got metal rings as well, which you can put moss in and then put your foliage in, so it's whatever people prefer. But look out for it. We're hoping to do it possibly on the 13th of December, which is a Sunday. But um, keep checking our Facebook page and website for more details. So that is me. Is there any more questions? I've noticed a few come in um, while Peter gets back to the polytunnel. anyone got any comments or anything? Probably best to wait for Peter to Hi, sit down and have his back. <laughs> Yay, that's the back right now. You're muted in video. Video. There we go. Um, looking at we can table. see the, the table cloth. Uh, <laughs> hi there. That's better. Yay. Right. <laughs> Welcome back. Apologies for rattling through that at Britain Edge speed, but... Um, the iPad's all wet. <laughs> yeah, we're getting soaked here. Uh, so anyway, I, I covered most of what I wanted to, rather, albeit rather hurriedly, so we'll start thinking about taking the questions then. Um, yeah, question so far, just some conversation in the breakout room. Rod, you had a question for Peter. Rod. Um, Rod's been planting his garlic and onions and, and getting all on hand with that. Uh, Rod, can you hear me? Um, but he's saying, is there anything that's more exciting that we can do over winter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, despite the weather. You can read seed, seed catalogues <laughs> and dream. Yes. Um, see, yeah. Good. Um, another one um, from Marion, uh, Wayne. Marion, are you happy to answer the, ask the question to Peter? Yeah, sure, of course I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Peter, um, I'm a little bit, um, how can I say, envious of your uh, green maturing garlic there because over the years I've never, ever been successful to get them to a mature state to eat. They seem to sort of die off or rot. I mean, I haven't got a clue. When I don't try in the garden, it seems to succeed. But when I do try, um, it um, it doesn't work. So what would you suggest is what I'm doing wrong? Well, are you getting them in nice and early, Marion? Um, yeah, I must admit, I have been a bit later um, the last year I put them in. But would you suggest, is it March time or is it now? No, now. You say okay, you do it, that's what I'm doing wrong. You plant it before the shortest day and you harvest it before the longest day. Brilliant. Okay, okay. that's great. Is there a and, particular variety? Uh, it depends. You've got determinate and indeterminate, which is more or less how many cloves you have. Um, the, uh, the really big ones are the carcassonne. Right. Uh, Isle of Hunt garlic. And then the ones that are grown in this country are usually from the Isle of Wight. And if you normally got the name Wight, W-I-G-H-T in them. Um, so go online. You should be able to order them now. They'll get to you and you can pot, put them up in pots. If you've got a greenhouse or a polytunnel. No, nope. but I've got a windowsill. <laughs> well, that would do. It's just that you're stealing a march on time by putting them into pots first. They'll make roots nice and quickly. Okay. And then on a, a nice mild late autumn day, you can get them in the ground. Perfect, the other, Peter. The other thing that I'd maybe, because of your part of the world, Suffolk, uh, don't let them dry out at all between April 
and the end of May, which is probably okay. a dry time of year for you anyway. Yeah, because that be. will definitely check them and they'll go to, into what's called the senescence, you know, they'll start to try and ripen too early. Hope right. that helps. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I was just going to say, do you plant them quite deep? Because it was suggested I literally just put the tip in, you know, the base in. And, and basically you see a lot more of the white, shall we say, above the soil level? Or No, that... no. Put them in deeper. OK. Because they, they are prone to pushing themselves out of the ground and then falling over. OK, brilliant. Thank you so much. That's brilliant help. Thank you. Uh, the other Marion, you had questions about bananas, and what was the other one? Marion, are you there? Yes, I yes. am. Yeah. yeah. Would you like no, I was just wondering. Um, I've got lots of peppers I've grown, capsicums, and they're not ripening. And I noticed you were putting bananas with tomatoes. Does it work with peppers as well? If you put tomatoes and um, bananas in. Can't say I've ever tried that, Marion, because I've found that they tend to go from green to red on their own. Right. Even time. as late as that, uh, even as late as this in the year. Yeah, well, the thing is that uh, during that process, they're becoming sweeter. Yeah. So a sunny windowsill, but obviously try and stop them from going too shriveled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, and um, the other thing was I've got lots of laurel. Is there any particular time of year that it's best to cut the laurel back? Is that cherry laurel? Yes. Yeah, you can hack that right to the ground. And in fact, it's best to do it over the winter months so you avoid disturbing any nesting birds in the spring. Right. OK, I do have quite a lot of nests in it. So, yes, I'll do that over the winter. Um, I did have one more. Oh, yes. Out of date seeds. Now, I've never thrown out a packet of seeds. I just plant them anyway. And you know that just fewer of them will germinate. Is mm -hmm. there, I mean, is that wrong? Or should I go out and buy new seeds all the time? Well, it depends on the family of vegetable plants or plants in general that you're uh, having the seeds of, because some last for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And think that brassicas do but others are notoriously short li lived like parsnips right so, okay uh, do a bit of research and uh, the other thing that you can do is just sprinkle a wee bit onto a piece of blotting paper on them um you know on the saucer and see if they germinate oh right do a yeah, check first you, yes do a check first oh, okay thank you um someone had a question about the green manure um just to sort of highlight the types of green manure you used, Peter, will be handy. You okay. mentioned two different ones there. Right, well, you get various types of green manure and uh, when to use them depends on the type. If you're using them quite late on in the season, like we did, then the grazing rise and the mustards are more likely to germinate. Whereas using things like vetches and tares, which are the other classic types tend to take longer to germinate. That includes the uh, clovers. So they'll want to be sown in late summer as opposed to in autumn. Hope that covers that. Um, a question from Ray. Is it Ray? Sorry, my eyesight is terrible. I should put my glasses on. Didn't you? Ray, um, what's the best way to use seaweed for beds? Ray, that's your question. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I definitely compost it first because any fresh material that needs broken down uh, is going to be taking the, the uh, energy out of the bacteria and fungi that you've got in your soil. So if you just mix it through with your compost, right. either that, if, you, if, you can manage, if you can put it on top of your surface and leave it for a few months, that, that would be good too. Um, at this time of year, you're probably quite safe to dig it in um, and leave it for the overwintering uh, soil activity to break it down a bit. But it also depends on the type, because if you've got some of the tougher ones like bladder rack or um, kelp, then they really should be composted first. But if it's things like your um, the green and uh, red sea lettuces, they, they'll rot down really quickly. So 
Yeah, it was the it was the stuff that you find in tape or on the on the wee beach. This all got smashed up by the the waves. I was gonna um, get some of that. Yeah, well, some has just been delivered here for the forest garden project, so um, it would be a first for me to see just what can I must go and have a proper look at it. Uh, but yeah, if you can possibly uh, dig it in now or add it to your composting system. Great. Don't, I wouldn't put it into the beds just before you put a crop in. That's what I'm trying to say. Isn't it, right. isn't it best to leave it to weather as well to wash the salt out? That's a good point. Did you hear that one, Lou? Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Or maybe just taking a hose over it on a sieve to get the salt out. Yeah, I'd probably be not be planting anything at all. Um, the spring anyway, or so when like next year, so mm -hmm. I'll have a few months to sort of uh settle in, right? Thank you, right. thanks, Peter. Um, we've got another question from David. Can you hear me? Hello, David. His question, if he doesn't come in and interrupt me, he's tried rye grass and forage peas green manure mix, but they have planted it too late. When was it planted, sorry, Ali? Um, September-ish. There we are. Sort of mid-September. Has it germinated? It has, yes. It's very small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, one of our beds, I should have pointed out, the one of them that we sowed rather late as well, uh, they germinated but hadn't grown much. Uh -huh. I think so, I discovered it too late, so when I went to buy seed, most of the seed merchants and sold out. <laughs> September should have been fine for a decent yeah. German. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. anyways, it's, it's coming through. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's just looking very thin at the moment. So, yeah. Well, by the time you want to dig it in, it might have put a more, you know, a spurt of growth on. Oh. Uh, February and March time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good, good luck with it. <laughs> okay. Next one uh, from Mark O'Reilly. O'Reilly. Um, this is about the cloves of garlic, Mark. Yeah, I just wondered if it was um, okay just to, to plant the cloves of garlic that you buy in the shop. But I have had a useful suggestion from Manuela that it is okay, provided it's organic. Yeah, I mean, the whole point about things like potatoes, onions and garlic being raised especially for replanting is that someone has rogued it and made sure there hasn't been any disease uh, like they do with red seed potatoes, for example. So it's all certified stock. I don't see a problem with bringing up a garlic clove from a greengrocer uh, because obviously if it's got a very healthy looking, what's called the basal plate, where the roots come from, then it should be fine. Um, again, if it had had the most notorious of those allium diseases, the white nose fungus rot, then it wouldn't have got to the supermarket shelf in the first place. So I, w I wouldn't make a habit of it though, just mm -hmm. in case. I just thought, I, I hadn't thought about growing garlic and I just thought I could just take some from the kitchen and put it in the next some dry of, day. Some of the garlic that you buy from the shops has come from Spain and places, and so it's not suited to our climate. Because the seed that you buy, this come from the the Isle of Wight, okay, or or, or other places, but it's it's, useful. it's selected. Yeah. Okay. So, so look for country of origin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Another question, Manuela. You've got a question about your compost. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, our compost is still quite clunky. Um, but we need to free up the space to put new stuff in. So I was wondering if it's still clumpy like that, is it better to just leave it on top of the beds through the winter or should I dig it in now or leave it until spring to dig it in or not dig it in at all? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, that clunky is a very technical term, isn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, ideally you don't want too much organic matter that's not been broken down yet. Uh, because of this nitrogen uh, robbery thing that goes on when the bacteria and fungi are trying to break down your material rather than giving um, nutrients to the plant roots in, in the growing season. 
So I would certainly leave some on the surface of the soil and see what the frost does to it, because it could break it down into a more friable material. And the winter rain, we might wash in some of the, uh, essentially the material that's going to make lovely um, humus in your soil. And then in the spring of the year or the late winter, you could just rake off any of the uh, very fibrous material that's left over and put that back into the compost heap. Now, I can understand your problem uh, of, you know, having to free up the space to put more compost in to make some more. Have you got anything to add about that? Well, you can just put it, put it on the ground and then cover it for the winter and it will continue to mature on the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Right. Any more any more questions, everybody? Because we are sort of getting towards the end of time. Um, if there's nothing more pressing, then I've put a link in the chat, the online evaluation form. Is that okay, Kashka? For me to do that? Well, unless people have more questions, because there's still did, 10 minutes to go. Okay, I did ask. Um, is there any more questions? Everyone's gone very quiet. <laughs> I was just if, if, hi. Yeah. No, I was just wondering. I mean, with all the leaves falling at the moment, what I've done in the past is just put them on my beds, um, and then I cover them for over the winter. Will that is that a good idea, or is that leaching out um, in the way that has been discussed before? It depends on the species, Marion. Right, it's um, a mixture of cherry and. Um, Trying to think what else is in my garden. Fruit tree leaves generally. Yeah, th this should be okay. It's things like beech, oak, sweet chestnut, and things like that that take forever and ever to break down. Well, I don't have any of those, so that's well, all right. <laughs> so the, the the leaves that you've got, it should be fine, because right, good. You see, at this time of year, some of the big lobworms yeah. will actually grab a leaf and pull it down into their right body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what I do with my raised beds is I put, you know, uh, leaves that have been on the surface and so on. And I cover the beds with plastic or, or a film anyway, so that um, it holds the moisture in the ground, but um, they can't all blow away all the leaves and everything. Um, and by the, the spring, it all seems to be fairly well rotted down. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Old carpets are in this one as one. You know, ones with proper jute backs rather oh, than right. uh, yeah. Best Axe Minister. <laughs> Best Axe Minister. <laughs> oh right. <laughs> <laughs> should it be a waterproof covering or should it be a perme permeable one? Or doesn't it matter? It don't, well, I would think that um, permeable would be better. Right. Okay. Yeah. It allows the soil to breathe as well. There's gases exchange going on. 